let us just try okay, and uh, introduce the uh, topic of uh, fixing nitrogen let me focus on the first of both you know uh, this is one okay and this is the other right remarkably you know both of these uh, actually have a link uh, with uh, fixing of nitrogen okay <laughs> now uh, let us first uh, understand uh, why it is why it was so important okay uh, now uh, if you uh, 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 you know i have uh, uh, talked to you all uh, uh, about this before uh, but uh, uh, it was really uh, a very stirring call uh, in the 19th century you know which uh, alerted people uh, that uh, uh, that you know uh, uh, unless mankind uh, does something about nitrogenous fertilizer the chili saltpeter is going to uh, run out and they are also estimated that at most uh, it can last up till 1950 you know and then after that uh, uh, civilization would be in great peril it was this person really crooks in uh, uh, way back you know in the uh, in the 19th century uh, that he said that the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen is one of the great discoveries awaiting the ingenuity of chemists when i say chemists obviously it was chemists and chemical engineers you know uh, and uh, other engineers as well you know i mean uh, they, they all uh, uh, made it happen you know and uh, uh, and and you know what uh, haber says uh, in his novel lecture uh, is that uh, uh, really uh, if it had not been uh, for that kind of an sense of urgency and importance of the problem it's unlikely that he would have worked on it you know so in a way you know haber is actually in the same league as uh, we found louis pasteur that he 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 liked to work on worthwhile problems problems which were extremely important and as he, uh, pasteur laid out an entirely new area of science uh, so did haber you know in in, in basically uh, uh, doing this okay and uh, uh, you know four fifth uh, of the entire uh, 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 nitrogenous uh, uh, products you know which were being made at that time from chili saltpeter four fifth was going for fertilizer and one fifth okay was going for uh, ammunition you know and uh, uh, mostly it was it was that you know and and that was the importance okay of uh, nitrogen fixing now let me also tell you that uh, you know if you look at the information now this is of course a bit old okay so it's about 20 uh, almost close to 25 years old uh, so there will be some change but not a whole lot okay uh, but you can see uh, that uh, the biological fixation uh, of uh, nitrogen okay and uh, uh, is uh, is about two times Uh, that of the non biological uh, fixation of nitrogen okay so uh, let no one uh, misunderstand uh, the importance of uh, biological fixation and it is quite possible uh, that in the future you know again biological fixation of nitrogen uh, could become uh, uh, extremely important okay and uh, in the non biological uh, there were uh, three one was of course the natural phenomenon of lightning okay the second was combustion uh, you see the ingenuity of people and the third was industrial processes okay which people were uh, working on okay and the haber process etc obviously will fall into uh, the industrial uh, process you know now but again remember uh, like we said that uh, when we said that you know you're talking about research and there is always someone who has done something before you, you know? and in this particular case it is not an exactly the same thing that has been done but you know the fact of the matter is that when coal was being distilled uh, when people were trying to liquefy coal okay and uh, at that time you know in the distillation products uh, they discovered uh, that there is ammonia 
and that uh, something like about uh, uh, you know uh, one percent of uh, uh, of coal uh, by weight is uh, nitrogen. Right? Now, if you consider the vastness of how much coal we use, you know the one percent is not a small number, right? and uh, it is not surprising uh, that the first actually commercial products uh, for uh, uh, nitrogenous fertilizer actually came from the ammonia uh, which was obtained from coal okay? and uh, and it was Liebig, you know who uh, who was the first person uh, who realized that all you have to do uh, is that combine it with sulfuric acid and remember in those days the sulfuric acid process was a very famous process although it was at that time mostly the chamber process you know which was in operation but it was extremely uh, well known and important okay so uh, it was not surprising that Liebig uh, basically realized that uh, ammonia is an alkali sulfuric acid is an acid I can combine the two uh, and it becomes such a user friendly uh, fertilizer you know and uh, so Heber uh, uh, of course mentions that uh, uh, in his Nobel uh, lecture which I will be uh, forwarding to you okay but you know let me also tell you that uh, I think we have uh, see this is the point that somehow uh, a, a wrong impression has been created uh, that uh, the Haber's process is the only process other than uh, biological processes and lightning uh, to convert uh, uh, atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. That's not true. There are people and and what is to say that the Haber's process, you know, okay, it's a catalytic process, you know, it required nitrogen and hydrogen and it uh, converted into ammonia. But who said that there's anything less uh, innovative and uh, uh, brilliant uh, about these processes which were developed long before Haber's process, 1860. Look at this. Lithium was reacted with nitrogen to form NLI3. They found that you reacted with water, uh, it gets converted into ammonia. The problem was they had difficulty in recycling the lithium hydroxide back into lithium, you know, because it requires uh, uh, molten uh, state electrolysis, you know, which was uh, uh, extremely difficult to do at that time. The next process, you know, improved on it. Okay, I mean it's almost like the hot air balloon. Okay, and uh, uh, they uh, just burnt carbon, coal, barium hydroxide, and nitrogen. Okay, and uh, they ended up with barium cyanide. And what they found is that barium cyanide reacts with water and releases ammonia, and you get back your barium hydroxide. Look at the beauty. Here, I have got lithium hydroxide, which I need to then convert back into lithium which is difficult here I didn't have to do that I got barium hydroxide at a lower temperature so I could actually keep recycling this you know? so it was a great industrial process you know? if someone could have integrated that with uh, uh, sulfuric acid what's wrong with this process you know? of course what's wrong is the amount of energy that it consumes you know? uh, and obviously nobody is telling you uh, that how much of uh, coal one had to burn uh, to do this you know? and then look at the third approach which is again an improvement uh, of the barium hydroxide approach uh, which was developed by Frank and Caro taking advantage of what taking advantage of the electric arc furnace number one the electric furnace okay and uh, who did that work Henry Moisan you know, he is the one who, uh, uh, you know, I am not very clear why he was doing this, uh, but he he started uh, heating up uh, lime uh, with uh, quick lime with uh, uh, carbon and ended up with calcium carbide. You know, probably, probably the reason could be uh, that he was actually thinking that that might be a way to uh, be able to make uh, elemental calcium. You know, and uh, uh, and uh, maybe form carbon monoxide, but that's not what happened. You know, what ended up happening uh, is really shown in this crystal structure, you know, 
that you ended up getting uh, carbide you know with two of these uh, uh, carbons joined together and the moment it was contacted uh, with moisture you know it formed acetylene okay and that completely opened up a new era completely new area uh, of synthetic organic chemistry as we know but remarkably you know it is interesting that instead of contacting it with water okay, uh, which is what uh, gave acetylene you know what was found by these people is that if it is contacted with nitrogen gas n2 it forms this compound calcium cyanamide okay yeah? this is cyanamide okay and remarkably when you uh, take cyanamide and contact it with water like here it releases ammonia and it gives you calcium carbonate you know? the brilliance of this was that you see whereas i could not do this work in the field naturally i can't leave barium hydroxide in the field okay this one i could because what i'm generating is calcium carbonate which is actually not so bad for soils in fact there are certain soils which benefit from the presence of calcium carbonate okay i mean if you have got uh, acidic soils for example you know it can react with calcium carbonate and neutralize the acid okay so uh, this was great and the ammonia could be generated directly in the field so the roots of the plant could directly take it you know? and so this was one of the greatest invention you know and it spun off uh, companies like american cyanamide you know uh, who were uh, uh, basically manufacturing uh, uh, cyanamide okay now the reason why i uh, also want to stress on this you know, is one do not over glorify uh, haber because in doing that Uh, we will be doing injustice uh, to these people who did equally great work you know in fixing nitrogen haber was certainly not the first person to fix atmospheric nitrogen okay. uh now let me also tell you what is interesting about these extraordinary uh, inventions you know, is that of course the haber process became uh, uh, very popular and uh, you know uh, everything else got steamrolled okay and uh, all of them perish you know all these other uh, uh, you know, alternative technologies but let me tell you that they survived longer than what we think they survived uh, up to close to about 30 uh, 35 years you know after the haber plant started uh, uh, getting introduced so there was a time when actually they were Uh, uh, ammonia was being produced by more than one technology you know? and uh, so american cyanamide uh, actually uh, uh, was a very popular company you know and their fertilizers were well known into the 40s okay? and uh, so uh, but look at this uh, although today uh, cyanamide you know calcium cyanamide has uh, no role uh, in the area of fertilizer but you know guess what that same calcium cyanamide you know when you instead of uh, uh, you know putting it in the soil and uh, generating ammonia uh, if you react it uh, with water and carbon dioxide at about 70 degree centigrade you know uh, it actually gets converted uh, first to cyanamide you know that means not the calcium salt uh, but the protonated uh, compound okay and this stuff you know when you raise the ph okay it forms this particular compound uh, which is known as cyanoguanidine okay now interestingly cyanoguanidine can react with a secondary amine you know like dimethylamine okay and it uh, you can look at the mechanism of how it happens i'm not going to uh, go through it okay and it ends up forming this particular compound which is known as metformin and guess what metformin is the largest selling drug for the treatment of diabetes even i take metformin you know and uh, you know it is just amazing going back to calcium cyanamide 
a little twist here and there you know taking that calcium carbide you know and uh, making calcium cyanamide but instead of uh, uh, ending up with ammonia you know i change the set of conditions and i end up with basically the blockbuster drug for uh, uh, for uh, diabetes today the largest not in india in the world is it's got its roots in calcium carbide and that electric arc furnace look at this also that that same calcium cyanamide when they reacted with sodium carbonate and carbon it converted to sodium cyanide and that is the birth of the entire process of extracting gold in pure form because gold reacted with sodium cyanide you know and formed this gold complex and then from there uh, i could recover pure gold you know and so that seventh that you saw cyanide process yet again uh, is linked to number one you know i mean it's just uh, uh, quite uh, quite amazing and uh, i hope you can see the the linkage you know between uh, the nitrogenous fertilizer which initially drove all this work because frank and caro made calcium cyanamide because they wanted to see if that they could produce ammonia but out of that spun off a diabetes drug spun off uh, the method of extracting gold you know i mean uh, uh, that's what uh, uh, great inventions uh, uh, do for you okay and uh, so elect the fixation the chemical fixation of uh, uh, nitrogen uh, precedes uh, the haber process by decades okay by almost half a century uh, the person who got the second prize uh, actually had put uh, nitrogen fixation right on top okay but the nitrogen fixation that is being talked about uh, in this competition is the electrical fixation of nitrogen not the haber process okay so by that time the haber process had already been uh, invented okay but clearly you can see that in 1913 uh, it it hadn't made uh, uh, that kind of an impact you know obviously the impact came soon after let us try to find out what exactly was this electrical fixation of nitrogen you know uh, which created such a stir and obviously this was also a technology which was commercialized because uh, that was very uh, it was one of the givens that uh, it had to be uh, uh, at least put in uh, in some kind of a scaled up uh, unit uh, somewhere so it's not just a laboratory curiosity okay it was uh, something which was considered uh, quite important okay and uh, now uh, let me also tell you how important it is Uh, even if you look at uh, haber's uh, lecture uh, and uh, what it says is that uh, you know uh, even uh, uh, much earlier on uh, people like cavendish and priestley they had actually uh, recognized that every time we have a lightning uh, that uh, you know there's very high local uh, uh, temperatures that are created and it of course creates like a spark you know so you can think of it as a, a spark across two uh, electrodes okay and uh, and what they had found uh, is that it actually produces some uh, uh, nitrogenous oxide uh, uh, compound you know so the nitrogen in the atmosphere uh, gets oxidized okay under those uh, conditions okay and uh, so that was uh, it, it is uh, cavendish and priestley who who really had uh, discovered that okay and what uh, haber says is that no better and more economical process for the binding of nitrogen could therefore be devised if some means could be found for converting electrical energy into this kind of chemical energy without waste okay and uh, yeah that's tremendous i mean you you are just not using anything else you you just have uh, uh, the atmosphere itself which is getting oxidized you know what could be better than uh, that and the oxygen <coughs> from the atmosphere is uh, being utilized for as the oxidizing agent you know? 
and the electric uh, spark uh, is really the trigger. So, I mean, in that sense, of course, it's a, a wonderful uh, uh, thing and nature does it. And so probably, you know, nature uh, was supplying uh, the, the nitrogenous fertilizer that we require in small doses, you know, when population was less, uh, people did not uh, consume so much food and uh, probably, you know, uh, some amount of fertigation uh, of the soil took place. Now, we then learn uh, that that was just a scientific curiosity, okay, and uh, nothing much happened, right, with, uh, with the electric uh, arc, uh, but later on, uh, Cavendish uh, also what he realized is that if he can generate very high local temperatures, uh, that maybe that's effectively what the electrical spark is doing. I mean, it is generating an extremely high uh, local temperature. And so what he did uh, was, uh, and, and he was not the only one. After him, uh, people like Bunsen, you know, uh, people who create the person who created the Bunsen burner. Okay, all of these people were effectively uh, trying to generate very high local temperatures. How did Cavendish try to do it? Uh, well, he uh, took excess air and he was burning uh, uh, hydrogen. You know, and, uh, and he found that there is some uh, nitric acid which is being formed. Okay, So uh, obviously the burning of hydrogen in air, uh, you can imagine that it can generate tremendous amounts of heat because it's so exothermic, the reaction. And within that time scale, uh, some amount of nitrogen uh, in the air got uh, oxidized. Okay, but it just remained as a uh, as a great uh, uh, experiment and a, a good piece of work, you know. But it was later on these two people, uh, Neville and Guy. Uh, these two people, uh, what they uh, found, uh, and they went back to the electric uh, spark. Uh, not this pushing uh, hydrogen to burn the uh, uh, burn the uh, uh, hydrogen and generate heat. Uh, but what they found uh, is that uh, you know uh, that it is not just the oxidation of nitrogen to NO uh, which is critical, uh, but if it remains in at that high temperature for too long or uh, if it remains in contact with the air, you know, uh, which which is there, uh, that uh, you, you know there's a tremendous loss of the uh, nitrogen oxide which is formed. And uh, so what it says is, uh, subsequent attempts to utilize the Cavendish reaction had little technical or scientific interest till 1895, when Neville and Goy uh, showed that where there is a certain concentration of nitrous gases in contact with the sparks, the ratio of oxidation to energy employed lessens greatly, you know. So, so basically either the, uh, it must be that the NO uh, was again getting uh, converted into uh, uh, useless uh, products, you know, or side products, and that's why it was uh, getting reduced. And then they concluded, hence, oxidized, oxidized air should be instantly removed from the sparking space. It must not be passed through again. So it's not as if you can just recycle again, you know, and if the conversion is less and you, you recycle, you cannot do that. Okay? And the sparking chamber should be as small as possible to hinder diffusion of oxidized air into the fresh air entering. So don't try to recycle or uh, you, you know, if it naturally diffuses, uh, that's going to uh, uh, worsen matters, okay? So that was considered to be a huge breakthrough uh, because uh, not only, uh, you know, it taught that it is not just the sparking and arcing uh, and to produce the anoxide, which is critical, but how you deal with the products after it is formed, uh, that it is very, very important, okay? And we know, of course, today, that uh, you know under those very high temperatures uh, the n oxide for example which forms you know it can again decompose back into n2 and o2 so uh, you know that's how you will lose and so you need to rapidly cool it down you know, 
either remove it from that space or rapidly cool it down okay and another could be that uh, uh, it it gets rapidly oxidized uh, to no2 you know that's exactly what happens uh, also when you rapidly cool it down okay so uh, so this was the big breakthrough uh, because uh, uh, those ideas could be then integrated uh, with newer uh, uh, ideas you know which were uh, being developed you know. after that you see that uh, these two people uh, berkland and i and i will send you berkland's paper you know. uh, the paper uh, and i'm sure the work that he did which uh, made it the greatest uh, uh, invention of the last 30 years since i mean uh, when this uh, uh, competition was proposed 1913 uh, and uh, but it's interesting Berkland was a physicist, okay? but they were both businessmen you know? and they were industrialists. And I was a civil engineer. You know? And uh, you don't see a chemist or a chemical engineer there. Okay? And, uh, uh, and yet, you know, these are the people who had a massive contribution uh, in this so called greatest process, you know, which is the electrical fixation of, uh, of nitrogen. And uh, so what did they do? One was that uh, as, uh, you know, uh, after the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, in the previous thing that we talked about of Neville and Goy uh, had uh, got popularized, you know, these two people, uh, Bradley and Lovejoy, you know, actually then uh, developed a unit, okay? And uh, they developed a unit where uh, uh, they could demonstrate uh, production of about 100 grams of nitric acid uh, per kilowatt hour of uh, uh, energy, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, of course, not 100 in this case, it was about 88 uh, grams uh, that they achieved, which was uh, pretty good, you know, uh, that they actually could make a device which, uh, which could do that. But then uh, these people, and I think it is Berkland, uh, because he was a physicist, you know, he was aware of uh, uh, things which are taking place in the physics world you know, and not at that time. You know. And uh, like what we found at that, uh, you know, when we were discussing about how the sun shines, uh, you know, many times these people have the ability to suddenly connect with something uh, which has been done many years back. Okay. And what they connected with was something which was done almost 40 years ago. Uh, from from the time when they uh, did their work, you know, and what what is it uh, that uh, uh, really they did? Well, what they found is that because you know uh, an arc is just a line, right? Uh, between two electrodes, you have an arc, okay? and so uh, uh, the if you even if you consider some amount of uh, width of that uh, arc, you know, the actual area is very limited. So you have a, only a limited amount uh, of uh, power uh, that you can supply to the unit, you know, uh, because you, it, it's all getting spread over that arc. You know? And if it is too high, uh, then the temperatures will be so high you know, that it will just burn up the electrodes, you know, it will completely destroy things. And so uh, uh, these people, Bradley and Lovejoy, uh, when they did their work, uh, and the furnace that they uh, built, uh, the arc furnace, uh, they were uh, not able to really pass uh, more than uh, 500 watts of uh, power uh, in that uh, furnace. Okay, and uh, but the, compared to the 500 watts, they did a pretty go good job uh, of getting uh, 88 grams per uh, per kilowatt hour. Okay, but then uh, Berkland. Uh, he, you know, uh, said that, uh, well, we need to increase the area, you know, of this arc. Okay? And uh, because you see the air also has to, uh, it has to go uh, into this hot zone. Okay? And uh, if it is only an arc, you know, the it's only a very tiny fraction of the uh, total air that you're flowing uh, that will actually come in contact with that arc. And uh, and I don't need, I mean, they needed temperatures in the range of 2000 to uh, 3000 degree uh, 
centigrade, you know, uh, but uh, they felt that, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, produce that kind of a temperature uh, even over a wider uh, area. Now, at the time what happened was that most probably Birkeland and uh, he uh, dug out a paper uh, by a very famous mathematician, you know, uh, Julius Plucker. You know, and uh, he, he was a mathematician, he was also a physicist. And uh, Plucker did some of the very pioneering work on cathode rays you know, and, uh, and where he applied some of the equations that he had developed, you know. Uh, it's, uh, again, I mean, I hope you can understand the way they, uh, these people worked, you know, mathematician working on uh, cathode ray, uh, Birkeland uh, uh, picking up clues from that. And what Plucker had shown was that uh, if I have an AC, you know, I mean an AC unit with uh, with an electric spark, you know, so it's uh, sparking uh, with an AC uh, uh, power supply. And then what he did uh, was that he uh, applied, you know, a magnetic field, okay, uh, across this uh, uh, electrode uh, area, okay. So there was a very strong magnetic field. Know, uh, which he uh, apl had applied okay? and he, he must have been doing that for whatever reason for uh, for the cathode ray uh, experiments that he was doing you know he must have had his own reason for doing it i didn't go into the original paper uh, and see but he reported something extremely interesting what he reported uh, was that you know an arc uh, actually sp spreads into a disk and uh, uh, this disk, uh, it is, uh, you know, they said uh, that when they looked at the disk, it's like looking at sun, you know, it was that powerful and intense, you know, it, it was unbelievable the kind of glow, you know, that this whole uh, uh, disk had created. And now you see, uh, there was sufficient temperature also, they could figure out uh, in this disk. And so now, you know, they could pass a lot more air and air came in contact with the disk rather than with the line. Okay. And uh, what that did uh, is that instead of being able to pass 500 watt of, uh, of power in a furnace, they were able to increase it to 500 kilowatt. Can you imagine that? thousand times 500 kilowatt you know a factor of thousand improvement in the amount of power uh, that they could supply to the furnace okay. second uh, you know was this great man i okay and uh, uh, these is all uh, uh, people from uh, norway and i you know must have been thinking uh, like a civil engineer you know and uh, you know, ended up making this unit, you know, it looks something like those cement mixer type of uh, uh, things, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, which they have uh, and, and it's mixing up the, uh, uh, up the, uh, uh, all the stone and uh, cement and all, and uh, uh, then they apply it. I mean, you see these kinds of units all over, you know, and it had to be circular because after all I had a disc, okay? So, uh, made it of a circular uh, uh, cross section, you know, uh, this uh, star, okay. And it's interesting, uh, when I did the calculation, this is for a 3000 kilowatt uh, unit, uh, that this unit can uh, produce uh, about uh, 7.2 tons per day, if you, if you are operating it continuously, say 24 hours, okay, uh, then uh, that's how much you can uh, produce, you can uh, do the calculation and, and and see for yourself, you know, that you'll be able to produce about 7.2 tons. Birkeland, in his article, which I will send to you, says that, you know, his estimate uh, at that time, I'm talking about 1903 or 6 or so, around then, you know, uh, that uh, uh, he envisaged a cost of about 1,000 pounds to make this unit. I am assuming that, uh, you know, the cost may have gone up by a uh, hundred times, you know, between then and uh, now, it, but it's still a very affordable unit. You know? 
and the interesting thing is uh, i don't have to conceptualize of uh, uh, nitrogen fixation in giant plants you know like when we talk about uh, uh, ammonia plant you know these are behemoths you know huge things okay but actually uh, you can even put these kinds of things uh, in every village okay qualifier but it requires electricity okay and uh, so uh, you know the question is uh, where is this power going to come from because uh, it still requires huge amounts of uh, uh, electricity okay and uh, so uh, just so that i can read out uh, i i uh, i'll send you this paper also by a person called renault you know is written in 1906 and nowhere there's no mention of uh, <clears throat> of haber anywhere they were actually comparing uh, this electric arc process with the uh, the cyanamide uh, process you know because these were the two grades and i don't think anyone really at that time anticipated that a third thing will be coming along okay yeah? uh, and and people were quite happy it's not as if uh, they thought that this is going to be the commercial technology of the future you know and uh, uh, not surprisingly that uh, uh, you know when these uh, uh, units came up people said great you know uh, we have we are able to make uh, uh, nitric acid and obviously if i take nitric acid and i uh, react it with lime for example i make calcium nitrate which i can apply in the field okay. so uh, uh, people could uh, use fertilizer and uh, so uh, let me uh, just read out okay uh, what it says uh, this large furnace works with an energy of 500 kilowatts and 5000 volts tension with alternating current arcs and direct current magnetic field okay so the magnetic field would uh, the electric disc is 2 meters in diameter so this is about 2 meters okay um um in diameter and its dazzling sun like appearance is photographed in figure 5 you know this is the photograph so the yield is about 100 grams of hno3 per kilowatt hour and advance on the 88 grams of the bradley and lovejoy process that's only a very nominal uh, additional incremental improvement uh, which they got but then what he says is the important part but this comparison in no sense represents the immense advantage of the birklandite process the point is that with the electric disc the inventors employ 500 kilowatts energy in one furnace whereas by other processes not more than 500 watts could be employed in one furnace thus birklandite can make 1000 times as much acid in one furnace in a given time as any of their predecessors can you imagine that have you heard i mean i i've never heard you know we we feel we gloat over you know increasing some clever uh, something that we did you know uh, understanding the impeller and uh, things like that maybe increasing the throughput from a, a plant by a factor of 2 you know and we feel Uh, so delighted at at what a great achievement it is thousand times you know i mean and you can see that when can you do this when you've got something revolutionary okay it's truly out of the box thinking that i can convert the uh, line in an arc you know into a into a disk okay? with a massive increase area you know? and now i can see that all the air will be pushing you know all along this disk is passing through okay so the probability of reaction increases tremendously and i've got a uniform temperature you know across that uh, across that disk now you know uh, this is fine uh, but then i uh, by the way uh, uh, one of you uh, uh, is uh, uh, did your seminar uh, uh, paper on some aspects of this work you know and uh, uh, now you know i was just reading this the other day okay uh, berkland's paper which i will send to you uh, and you can see on the oxidation of atmospheric nitrogen in electric arcs okay i'll send this paper to you now what i wanted 
was that uh, you know i wanted to see uh, some kind of a quantification you know it's all uh, very nice you know you see you hear this but and uh, nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth you know? what did berkland say rather than uh, uh, somebody else uh, you say you know i read this and this person said this and you're never very sure about what that person is saying you know, whether it's correct or not so i said let me go back to berkland's paper you know and read it and i also want you to do a simple calculation just so that i want to be sure that i didn't make any mistake okay uh, with this object in view and as a starting point for the following calculations i select a series of experiments made a year ago at our trial station at arendal with a 300 kilowatt furnace so mind you we are talking about a scaled up experiment you know not that uh, 500 kilowatt he uh, is talking about a 300 kilowatt but later on you know they could go to a 3000 kilowatt unit which is a tenfold uh, for the scale up okay during several days continuous working the energy of the furnace was kept very exactly at 300 kilowatts okay? while 12500 liters of air reduced to zero temperature and standard pressure so basically under normal conditions these uh, measuring it were blown through the furnace per minute so i know exactly how much nitrogen i passed okay and i know uh, how much of uh, Uh, let's say nitric acid i am producing and so obviously i'll be able to find out the conversion and i'll also i know i have passed 300 kilowatts you know i also know uh, how much what is the duration over which i am passing it okay and uh, so i can calculate the energy that actually uh, the system consumes so not so difficult to do this the outflowing gases had a temperature of 700 degree centigrade okay and contained so this is not the temperature at which uh, uh, the actual initial uh, uh, arcing and all goes on that probably takes place at about uh, 2000 degree centigrade still higher you know but this is at the outlet as it is going off you know uh, that temperature you know was 700 degree centigrade and contained a volume percentage of 1.07 of no you know so they were able to estimate the no Uh, concentration and then he says which answers to 179 grams of no per minute okay? so i know i am basically passing 300 kilowatts you know uh, for uh, 60 seconds you know that that's what i have okay so i know exactly how many joules uh, of energy was uh, uh, consumed okay and uh, i know how much uh, uh, of uh, uh, no i am forming and let me assume okay that uh, uh, even though at that time they probably could not do it but today it should be extremely simple because you know the oswald process where ammonia is converted into uh, nitric acid uh, via formation of no uh, is a very well established process so i just have to integrate the best of the modern technology you know uh, with uh, the buckland night process and and then see if you can make uh, nitric acid but then the question is uh, really what is the energy consumption okay so i did this calculation now can uh, you all quickly uh, yourselves do the calculation and just see uh, uh, whether uh, this number is right so i let me just tell you what i did 179 gram no per minute okay so uh, so therefore uh, you know i am uh, if i have to convert let's say all of the no becomes nitric acid okay so uh, molecular weight of nitric acid is 63 of no that is 14 and 16 30 so i'll get 63 upon 30 of hno3 and then uh, if i want to do it per hour okay into 60 all right and uh, just see if this works out to 22.5 uh, kg per hour can you do a quick calculation Uh, yes sir okay. now let us look at the energy uh, that uh, was spent and he says that it was 300 kilowatt okay and uh, uh, hour okay so uh, suppose i want to make 1 ton uh, of nitric acid okay so effectively uh, what do i need 
uh, I need uh, 1000 by 22.5 okay into uh, uh, let's say I want to convert it into megawatt hour so instead of 300 okay I take uh, uh, 300 into uh, 10 to the power uh, minus 3 megawatt hour so you know that comes to about 13.3 uh, 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 megawatt hour is everyone getting the same number or am i making a mistake uh, rajesh can somebody else also do it yes sir it's the same number it's okay yes 13.3 uh, uh, if i take all right uh, this and uh, just work out in terms of gigajoule how many gigajoule it will be one kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 into uh, 10 to the power 3 uh, joules, right? 60 into 60, 60 seconds and 60 minutes. And then I'm expressing it as megawatt. Okay, so just work out in terms of gigajoule, uh, whether it's coming to gigajoule per ton is the correct figure. It's correct, sir. Correct? Huh? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, now, I, you know, I'm talking about the uh, on something which was done a long time ago by Buckland and where he put up the unit, you know, so there is no question of anything going wrong uh, in this particular uh, figure. You know? So we've got some idea uh, of what is the kind of energy that is required, you know, uh, per ton of nitric acid. Uh, and uh, of course, this is only for the arcing, but then, uh, you know, I have to flow air. So I'll require a, a compressor, you know, uh, which has to be acting. I'm assuming that all those other things, you know, compressor, etc., will require uh, relatively much less uh, 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 power, you know, as compared to the main thing of, uh, of this electric arc. I, I remember that uh, I've, uh, uh, you know, seen this uh, plot. Uh, of uh, where they are talking about glorifying the Haber process, okay, and uh, they talk about the Birklandite uh, uh, electric arc method, you know, and how uh, there has been a massive uh, uh, transformation and how the uh, energy requirement, you know, in the Haber process uh, had come down, okay. Now, and you can see this unit is gigajoule per ton, you know, which is the reason why I did my calculation with uh, gigajoule per ton. Now, this is of course talking about ammonia, you know, and uh, I, of course in the Birkeland dye process, you don't make ammonia, you make nitric acid. Okay? Uh, but I presume we are talking about uh, fixing one equivalent of nitrogen. You know? uh, that's what, uh, whether it is ammonia or nitric acid, I've got one nitrogen, so I should be able to do a, a fair comparison, you know, of, uh, uh, of that. You know? Now, these people uh, have put the uh, Birklandite uh, process at uh, about 400 uh, uh, gigajoule per ton, you know, and the Haber-Bosch process, you know, uh, which we will discuss uh, uh, later on, uh, comes to about, you know, when I uh, looked at it, it comes to about 30, 35 uh, uh, gigajoule per, uh, uh, per ton, okay. And obviously, uh, what they're saying is, uh, you know, there was more than a tenfold uh, saving in uh, energy. I wanted to verify whether this is correct, you know. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a paper that I found by uh, a senior manager in the National Fertilizer Limited. So, where they make am uh, ammonia. So, this person must be knowing what he's talking about, okay. And uh, so, he, he talks about the total energy requirement for ammonia. Uh, which is the natural gas, the energy that is in natural gas, okay, the steam energy for which you get a credit, because uh, the ammonia synthesis is the exothermic process, so it evolves heat, uh, so I can get that uh, uh, energy, I get a credit for it, okay, and the power, you know, obviously uh, for pumping this, that, you know, I need power, you know, and he uh, uh, did a calculation, you, uh, I have not put all the details, I have only put the final uh, data, you know, and it comes to about 31.11 gigajoule per ton, which fits reasonably, you know, with, with this figure. So I know that this is correct figure. I also know that this is the right figure. I can understand, for example, that if, if they are trying to show a 
thermal equivalent you know because in the birkelandite process everything is electrical power okay now you know that to generate electric power from thermal energy like if you burn coal or natural gas or whatever you know the efficiency today i mean in the best plants uh, if you are uh, working on uh, 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 you know ultra supercritical uh, uh, plants uh, maybe uh, you'll get something like a, a 38 to 40% uh, efficiency i said okay maybe i'll convert it into a thermal equivalent uh, just so that uh, uh, you know i'm comparing like for like i don't know exactly uh, how how exactly they equated uh, nitric acid with ammonia and uh, did this calculation but the point i'm showing you why i'm showing you this is that uh, you know whenever you read a literature whenever you read something and especially as technologists and engineers uh, you always my must verify facts for yourself I actually worked out the number and i wanted you all to also see the number you know and uh, so like for example uh, if uh, if let's say in future uh, let's say nuclear uh, uh, fusion becomes a reality or uh, like uh, sonti was looking at uh, that if we can put up a plant in uh, uh, in africa in uh, uh, in in let's say the in congo you know where uh, uh, they have got uh, 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 the, you know hydropower from rivers uh, which are not being utilized and i can uh, utilize that electrical power okay then uh, the question is uh, that is it really so bad okay this birklandite process and look at it i don't need anything i only need air and water nothing else and there also if if i do it in africa that electricity is also coming from water you know so i i won't even say air and water and electricity i'll say air and water you know and uh, so i mean th that that would be uh, quite a uh, remarkable thing okay second is that you see everybody why firstly will i uh, uh, compare with ammonia right uh, because uh, like let's say if i am uh, producing nitric acid nitric acid goes into all am, uh, uh, ammunition you know it goes into uh, making ammonium nitrate which is the largest uh, uh, civilian explosive you know it goes into uh, um, uh, what uh, into ammonium nitrate fertilizer okay? uh, which is one of the best fertilizers known okay? it's not just urea uh, which is a nitrogenous fertilizer so and how is nitric acid produced they make ammonia then again they have to do another process to convert ammonia uh, into nitric acid so effectively i am first going from nitrogen at a zero oxidation state i am taking it to a minus 3 oxidation state in ammonia and then i am oxidizing it and converting it into a plus 5 oxidation state in nitric acid does that really make so much sense not to me so i i, I would much rather say uh, that forget about uh, making all of the ammonia uh, by this process or fixing uh, all of the nitrogen let me only concentrate on that part uh, which i require for making nitric acid you know? and why not make it from the birklandite process where i directly get nitric acid why would i do all this and uh, so you know uh, the reason why i'm uh, telling you this uh, is that uh, uh, that is part of critical analysis and especially uh, when the equipment is so simple okay. and, uh, and, uh, and and then it leaves uh, tremendous room for uh, innovation now i don't want to undermine the haber bosch process which we'll be discussing now okay i mean there's no question that it is uh, one of the greatest processes ever ever invented let's now go all right uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the haber uh, uh, process okay and let me tell you firstly haber himself was not working on the haber process this so called okay? haber actually was you know after the electric arc uh, people had also found uh, must be because of the thermodynamics of the process uh, that they started looking for 
the equivalent of a cold flame you know and they started looking at uh, corona discharge you know uh, these two people warburg and lighthouser uh, so you know when uh, they were doing this uh, i think that uh, probably heber had uh, uh, got some uh, uh, good results you know and so uh, bsf uh, came to uh, heber really to try and uh, persuade him to take up a project you know on the fixation of nitrogen with a corona discharge okay that's what he says in his nobel uh, lecture uh, this possibility aroused much interest during the first 10 years of this century mind you 1910 uh, you'll see that renoff uh, uh, article so we are still not talking about heber process then and from 1907 led me to start investigation which i pursued over a number of years so even when heber had actually discovered the uh, so called heber process you know he was still working on actually this other process is not as if he gave it up and then he says development has so changed opinion during the short 10 years that today it is already difficult to think oneself back into the views then generally held what is that view that this electric arc corona discharge is the way to go okay and then he says yet it is indicative that so experienced and professional a judge of chemical technical possibilities as the bsf thought so highly of my efforts to obtain improved efficiency from electrical energy in the combining of nitrogen and oxygen as to get in touch with me in 1908 and by providing their resources to facilitate my work on the subject so bsf came to heber for that electrical fixation of nitrogen which had already been demonstrated by berkland and i so they were in the b2 business you know they really did not actually come uh, for Uh, for making a great scientific invention but then what it says is also very interesting by that time you know there were already ideas floating around on the reaction of nitrogen with hydrogen you know uh, to make ammonia and we will talk about that you know and uh, uh, so you know heber was mightily uh, interested you know in uh, in that opportunity of making uh, uh, ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen that is no one was working specifically on that uh, although they had fixed nitrogen by other chemicals as we have seen uh, with as calcium uh, cyanamide and uh, the barium uh, cyanide uh, etc okay uh, and uh, so and he says something interesting so he must have told bsa please let me do some work on this uh, ammonia synthesis you know bas they probably said no no but then they said fine okay you want to spend a bit of your time doing that okay you do it and so he says whereas they agreed with every caution to the proposal to back me in the high pressure synthesis of ammonia as well approving it only with hesitation so you know so it was a very very chance thing uh, that bsf came to heber because he was working on electrical fixation of nitrogen uh, but he also had an idea and interest in making ammonia uh, and uh, you know uh, bsf uh, wanted to commercialize uh, uh, this berklandite process uh, and uh, okay they agreed uh, to uh, uh, to do this why was there so much of reluctance you know in this uh, uh, to back uh, heber uh, okay in 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 manufacture of uh, ammonia what was the reason so let us try and understand the reason it was particularly significant that earlier attempts had not succeeded so it is not that Hemo, uh, heber uh, was the first to try and make ammonia let us also get that uh, myth out of the way he didn't do that first time and certainly then didn't, didn't start working for the first time even fleetingly okay uh, in achieving with absolute certainty a spontaneous union of nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia so he says that 
nobody you know people tried but nobody really could make any ammonia this gave rise to the prejudice that such a production of ammonia was impossible and in the course of time this enjoyed considerable support in chemical circles and this is something let me tell you uh, if you have a like uh, today i'm talking about uh, uh, you know uh, hey uh, let's look at the buckland night process if somebody in those days said no no i think you know uh, we should try and put uh, half our energy into making ammonia you know and you are sitting in a meeting where all the guys are these uh, electrical fixation guys you know uh, and uh, uh, they will shoot you down you know and it requires uh, uh, almost a thick skin you know to uh, to uh, to to still argue your case which i think heber did you know so he obviously had uh, he didn't mind looking like a fool you know and uh, and he says that uh, the in the chemical circles and chemical circles means not people like us we are talking about the greatest of people you know, who shoot it down you know they they said no no it's not going to work and who were those people you know we will see who they were and uh, such a prejudice leads one to expect pitfalls which far more than clearly defined difficulties deter one from becoming too deeply involved in the subject that's absolutely true if you get demotivated because someone put you down you know and it's always playing in your mind no? i was insulted today you know i felt so bad you know oh god you know how it felt you know? and uh, and it's always playing in your mind and you what research you'll do after that certainly you'll 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 be so put off but that is heber's greatness you know he was not put off he still had that conviction that uh, making ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen uh, is not a bad idea and he stuck to his gun you know? and uh, why he could do it of course because in parallel uh, he was also working on electrical fixation of nitrogen so what was this prejudice all due to his prejudice was uh, for two reasons you know firstly it is not that no one had tried to make ammonia the people who first tried it are these two lord ramsay and young in england you know england of course as you know uh, is 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 the place where many concepts are first mooted you know they are great at generating ideas concepts you know? and uh, so uh, these two people actually were trying uh, the synthesis of uh, uh, ammonia uh, from nitrogen and hydrogen okay and uh, uh, they were using an iron catalyst okay i have always wondered why why did they uh, why were they working on iron you know? i had some thoughts uh, which probably are wrong uh, i uh, i don't know what was in their mind maybe they tried many things and uh, uh, nothing worked and uh, at least they got some uh, uh, results with uh, iron uh, but there is something else which uh, Uh, tells me that they took a clue you know from somewhere uh, and they started working with iron as a catalyst but they could never make it and they were trying to do their reactions uh, at about uh, uh, you know at high temperatures they were putting up flame and doing it uh, at one atmospheric pressure you know uh, but uh, they, they when they didn't succeed uh, you know they did something very brilliant you know which is they said uh, what happens uh, if we try to go in the reverse direction which is that uh, if i take ammonia you know and heat it up you know to these temperatures what happens and uh, what they found is that that ammonia uh, decomposes to nitrogen and hydrogen at those very high uh, uh, temperatures okay and uh, which is the reason probably why they were Uh, not able to make any ammonia you know uh, in the forward direction but there was something which was very very interesting which they observed 
and that is that doesn't matter you know for how long they kept doing this okay they always found a faint smell of ammonia you know in their uh, in their uh, uh, product mixture that is all the ammonia did not decompose to nitrogen and hydrogen and uh, i think that uh, that was the trigger uh, for uh, for the thinking uh, that uh, maybe this is an equilibrium control reaction and uh, you know the thoughts around equilibrium uh, were actually uh, being developed at the time you know many of the ideas around chemical equilibrium were de being developed and who were the people working on this you know after ramsey and young had done this work i show you there were people like nuns okay there was le chatelier le chatelier might have said that uh, you know i have already explained uh, how you can uh, drive an equilibrium to the right you know by doing various things uh, including removing products you know so maybe you know le chatelier had those kinds of ideas in his mind and not only that le chatelier probably had succeeded to a small extent what heber says is that by 1901 le chatelier had already given thought to the effects of temperature and pressure failure of the first attempts at synthesis however led him to abandon the matter and to publish his deliberations only in the obscurity of a french patent taken out under a foreign name now this is very interesting you know of course uh, heber is a german you know germans and french uh, uh, have always had their uh, uh, air of superiority uh, differences what are they talking about of obscurity of a french patent the french for the leaders in chemical research you know where is the question of an obscurity of a french patent okay but yeah, at the same time probably uh, le chatelier was very shy of uh, uh, being humiliated and maybe he did not reveal his name you know uh, he uh, he just uh, 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 sort of uh, published the patent uh, under a pseudonym okay and uh, interesting you know you can also see the insecurities of uh, people and then heber says this only came to my notice a long time after the successful con conclusion of my experiments forget about whether it came to your notice or not the fact of the matter is that le chatelier had taken a patent you know he may not have got outstanding results but he probably got some extent of conversion and uh, so again uh, certainly heber was not the first one you know to have uh, to have done this and then you know it's also interesting nern succeeded in finding an approximate formula which permitted a prediction of the equilibria based on the values of the heat effect of the so called chemical constants okay and also uh, they had worked out uh, uh, a relationship uh, with temperature uh, which i will uh, you can have a look at the appendix of uh, heber's uh, uh, patent it seems to me uh, that uh, um, you know what made heber successful is that heber had an equipment heber was the one who was smart enough to design and develop a equipment which allowed him to study the reaction over a wide range of temperature and pressure which none of these other people could do they could only do reactions at high temperature under atmospheric conditions you know so they didn't have that but when uh, 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 you know uh, uh, nerns uh, found out that heber has this equipment uh, he apparently told uh, uh, someone uh, that why don't you ask heber uh, to actually carry out some systematic studies you know as a function of temperature and pressure and uh, that's what heber did okay uh, and uh, you know i'm not very sure from which direction he approached the equilibrium you know uh, this i have uh, Uh, shown you all and taught you all uh, when i was teaching you all industrial engineering chemistry you know this is from heber's uh, uh, novel lecture you know 
that he actually did a study with varying temperatures you know and varying pressures okay these are the varying pressures you know and he found that at high temperatures and at one atmosphere pressure which is what uh, 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 ramsey and young were trying to do you know the amount of ammonia uh, by the equilibrium is extremely low 0.0044% that's it you know but he found that as he increases the pressure you know uh, it comes close to about a percent when he lowered the temperature you know uh, he could actually uh, demonstrate Uh, that you can actually get about 86% conversion if you can carry out the reaction at 200 degree centigrade you know at 200 atmosphere pressure you know i mean that was a remarkable piece of dark work uh, which uh, uh, heber did you know and uh, frankly it is one of the uh, really greatest uh, uh, experimental data uh, which was generated but what heber had realized you know at that point is that uh, uh, you know unless uh, one can carry out the reaction at a reasonable temperature it's not going to work right? and uh, so heber was probably doing a lot of his initial work uh, also with the ramsey and young uh, uh, iron catalyst you know and uh, you know he was not able to uh, uh, obviously get conversions because that iron catalyst was showed activity whatever residual minimal activity it had only at a very high temperature and so uh, and and so uh, not surprisingly the uh, conversion of uh, uh, nitrogen hydrogen to ammonia was extremely uh, low you know and that's when uh, heber made his uh, very very great discovery uh, that uh, osmium uh, is a great catalyst you know and with osmium Uh, he could reduce the uh, the temperature to about uh, 500 degree centigrade you know and you can see 500 degree centigrade okay and a pressure of 200 bar uh, will give you close to about a 18% conversion not bad for making ammonia you know? and heber could achieve this high pressure because he had developed this high pressure equipment again i hope you can understand uh, like uh, uh, norman sutin you know developed the stock flow equipment and could measure uh, the electron transfer rates you know uh, that how important it is for you to have something very unique do you have something unique if you have a if you had a high temperature pressure apparatus you could do things which nobody else could do you know and that was one of the reasons why uh, heber was Uh, successful yeah. now uh, by the way uh, after uh, around the time that uh, heber got his uh, uh, nobel prize you know uh, another great man uh, oswald you know uh, who got the uh, nobel prize for his studies of uh, chemical equilibrium you know uh, he to uh, uh, try to claim credit you know uh, for uh, uh, for this whole process apparently he had done work you know, and uh, uh, oswald was working very closely with bsf and what he says is that as the expert immediately recognizes the basic ideas on the synthesis of ammonia which has become so important were clearly and unambiguously stated then march 1900 you know thus i am justified in calling myself the intellectual father of this industry i have certainly not become its real father for all the difficult and varied work needed to create a technically and economically viable industry from the right ideas was carried out by those who took on the abandoned infant and look who's talking oswald we have seen le chatelier nuns you know they all worked on it they did not succeed okay? and they did not succeed uh, 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 because heber had the equipment and they didn't you know? and uh, but in terms of probably intellectual competence you know ability they were probably way ahead of heber in terms of uh, uh, sheer intellect 
no? but he was a Fide. Yes. Now, then comes the interesting part, and that is uh, what I want you to, uh, what I will be focusing on uh, uh, for the rest of my lecture. You know. And uh, so, you know, when Heber had demonstrated this uh, work with Osmia, yes, and he was, as you know, uh, working with BSF, at that point, BSF got interested. And uh, BSF said, uh, you know, we would like to take your work forward. Uh, and uh, Bosch was the person uh, who was uh, uh, selected to head the uh, team uh, who would be interacting with uh, Haber on this. Okay, uh, but Bosch, after he studied uh, the the work of uh, Haber, you know, he said uh, there's no way uh, this can be a commercial process. Uh, even forget about uh, achieving only 17, 18 percent. Uh, Ammonia, even if I, if we assume that that's not uh, uh, bad, you know, and uh, it's not going to happen. And uh, the reason was because you see, Haber uh, was probably, uh, you know, he may have borrowed the uh, pure nitrogen from Linde uh, and also probably got the ideas of uh, his equipment from uh, the air liquefaction work, you know, where they were already using high pressure. And probably generated hydrogen from uh, uh, maybe from electrolysis of uh, uh, water, you know. And there were others, you know. People had uh, actually introduced the uh, or expanded the uh, liquefaction of air uh, to liquefaction of hydrogen, uh, which was a much more difficult job, you know. But they had done it, okay. and uh, so one could actually liquefy hydrogen, uh, or you could generate it from electrolysis. But either way. Uh, you know, these were very prohibitive uh, uh, costs, you know. And so uh, when BSF looked at it, they said, if this is the way hydrogen and nitrogen is going to be obtained, forget it, you know, we will never be able to make a practical process, you know. And that is what uh, led to then uh, uh, the development uh, of uh, steam and air reforming, uh, you know, where uh, they could uh, convert uh, a feedstock like ammonia and coal, which they were comfortable using, okay, and they could uh, generate uh, hydrogen from that, and they could also generate the nitrogen uh, from the air uh, by consuming up all the oxygen, you know, and uh, so, and you know how important steam and uh, air reforming is, uh, but don't forget uh, that it was all developed, you know, as part of the quest uh, for making ammonia. Uh, I will spend less time on the uh, steam and air reforming because uh, it's something that uh, uh, you all have been taught, you know, uh, but uh, this is the birth of the steam and air reforming uh, processes. The second was that uh, they said uh, Haber has used uh, osmium, you know, and, uh, you know, osmium and Haber had also used uranium, okay, but uranium, you know, uh, was a, a very uncertain beast at that time. Uranium had begun to get famous because of uh, uh, the work of Becquerel and uh, and the uh, uh, you know uh, discovery of radioactivity. Uh, but people were not familiar with uh, use of uranium in any chemical processes. So you know there was less interest in uranium. Uh, there was greater interest in osmium. Uh, but uh, uh, what we learned from uh, Bosch's lecture and also from a subsequent lecture by someone called Ertl, you know, is that uh, uh, osmium was a very, very rare element. You know? And uh, they said, our plan is to make millions of tons of, uh, uh, of uh, ammonia. You might have done it in the lab with some osmium, but how are we going to do it in, the, uh, in a scaled up version? Because uh, there's just not that much of osmium available anywhere. Okay. And the third is again something that we learned from Bosch's uh, lecture. You know. And this is the part that I want you all to focus on in one of the uh, presentations that you will bake on uh, chemical engineers who change the world. I want you to focus only on uh, Bosch. Okay. And I want you to focus only on this part, uh, which is the construction of apparatus, okay? 
and uh, uh, you know i will of course introduce it and i'll discuss a, a bit about it uh, but i want you all to work out the details you know uh, from bosch's uh, novel lecture and why was the construction of apparatus important because heber had done the work only in a laboratory uh, at a small scale okay and they encountered numerous problems you know when they tried to use heber's equipment okay? and so uh, bosch was and bsf basically identified uh, these three you know as the very very important stumbling blocks uh, which will have to be uh, addressed you know uh, if they are going to be successful in uh, being able to commercialize heber's technology now uh, you know uh, and and what he says is why why was there a concern about uh, hydrogen let us try and see what bosch says none of the then known hydrogen processes was suitable for large scale manufacture we examined all of them but without exception they were too expensive or yielded insufficiently pure gases it must not be forgotten that the procurement of hydrogen is the largest item in the prime cost at least nowadays he is giving a nobel lecture in 1932 you know so nowadays means 1932 Uh, since because of the efficiency of the high pressure synthesis the conversion of the ready made gas mixture into ammonia is only a minor cost factor so making ammonia after uh, hebel's discovery you know making ammonia from as if you get nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia was considered trivial uh, by that time that was not the issue the issue was how will i get hydrogen and nitrogen in the desired 3:1 uh, uh, stoichiometry which are required okay and then he further goes on to say since we were dependent on coal as a starting material we at once decided because coal used to be the source of all energy we at once decided on the sole eligible source in our situation water gas from which nowadays after a short transition separation of hydrogen by linde's low temperature liquefaction method that was the transition period hydrogen is manufactured in enormous quantity by a catalytic process developed by us you know and that is the steam reforming process that he is referring to and uh, uh, you know one of the greatest inventions uh, ever made and i am not going to go through this process uh, but as you know uh if i for example start with natural gas you know i can uh, uh, uh and uh, i can convert it into co plus h2 okay and if i do a water gas shift reaction i can again get more hydrogen and convert the co into uh, co2 okay also if i introduce uh, air you know uh, along with this hydrogen and i make plenty of hydrogen okay then i can uh, burn Uh, some of the hydrogen okay and so that i can consume up all the oxygen in air and so i'll be left only with nitrogen okay? so ultimately i'll be, have nitrogen hydrogen carbon dioxide as a by product you know and uh, water you know which is formed in the in the process okay and uh, uh, those are the th things that they separated out you know and uh, and did a few other uh, uh, things like uh, trace impurities of carbon monoxide uh, which they uh, removed and ended up uh, with a 3:1 uh, mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen you know uh, with which then uh, do, they could carry out the rest of the process you know so steam reforming followed by air reforming uh, was uh, uh, the first uh, thing you know that they addressed the second thing that you have to remember is that you know bosch identified three problems not one and so <clears throat> he broke up you know this large uh, problem uh, into sub problems okay and uh, developed one team which exclusively focused uh, on this reforming uh, uh, process you know uh, and and said you go and try to see how to make it successful they had to invent catalyst to make it happen you know they had to remove 
They had to invent the purification steps, everything. That was done by one team. He put another team and told them, you focus on cattle dairy. You try and see how to substitute for osmium. And the third group, they, he said, you know, you go and develop the equipment. Okay? And he was probably uh, very involved with the third group uh, because Bosch himself uh, was a metallurgist, you know, and with a very good experience in metallurgical uh, engineering uh, as well as in uh, mechanical engineering. So, uh, so th th that's how uh, they assembled three very, very large teams, uh, you know, to look at these uh, problems. You know. Now, uh, let us look at the catalyst part, okay? because it was such an important uh, uh, problem, because uh, if they could not, you know, get the right catalyst at the right cost and in sufficient quantity, there was going to be no uh, process for ammonia. Okay. Now, you know, uh, uh, what has always struck me uh, as interesting is uh, what Bosch said is that, look, if we are going to exclude osmium and uranium, because, uh, you know, uranium for us is a, a rare beast, osmium there is very little of, you know, and uh, what else do we have? They said, well, what you have is what Ramsey and Young did, you know, where they did some work with iron. That was the only other catalyst that people had worked on, FE. And so, you know, uh, they said, uh, uh, you know, it's best to bet on horse, which, uh, which at least has run something. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, they said that, look, <coughs> even if it gives uh, half a percent or one percent uh, conversion, uh, uh, you know, we as industry uh, can see if we can try and uh, improve it, you know, uh, the catalyst. Okay? And in fact, you know, this reminds me uh, of something which uh, some of my uh, friends would tell me, uh, people who had worked with H.C. Brown, you know, uh, who uh, got the Nobel Prize for uh, hydroboration chemistry, you know, and uh, Brown was in Purdue University and a uh, great, uh, brilliant scientist, as you know. And, uh, you know, all these people who would work with Brown, you know, some of them are extremely close friends of mine. Brown would say, you demonstrate to me even 1% conversion, you know, like in a, in a boron-based uh, transformation. And he said, uh, uh, you, you, you know, Arun, you, you just do that. And don't worry, you leave it to me, I'll convert it to 100%, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, that's that's it, you know, that can I make that first bit and demonstrate a proof of concept that, yes, it can be done. Okay? Then, you know, to be able to uh, uh, make it in uh, uh, more efficiently uh, is something that some people are very good at. And that requires a different kind of uh, uh, competence, you know. Uh, people who excel uh, in uh, perfecting something. There are some people who excel in conceiving an idea. There are some people who excel in studying it in great depth and perfecting it. You know? And H.C. Uh, Brown uh, belonged to that uh, uh, group of people. You know? Now, I was actually, uh, you know, always intrigued by how this iron uh, actually uh, came about and why Ramsey and Young uh, focused on iron, you know, and uh, or maybe they did focus on other things. I don't know, you know, uh, but iron is the one one uh, hears about a lot. And, you know, it it uh, it seemed to me quite inspiring that suppose like let's say I had no clue what to use. And I'm going back to the time of Ramsey and Young. Okay? I had no clue uh, what is a uh, what is a catalyst. Yeah. Where could I possibly go for inspiration? You know? And uh, I was thinking to myself, maybe I will go to uh, uh, to nature. You know? After all, nature fixes the nitrogen. Leguminous uh, plants fix nitrogen. You know, so uh, could I try and figure out, you know, uh, what is this 
this enzyme which uh, uh, does this job and what does it contain you know and uh, you know i am not sure that there is any correlation uh, between the enzyme uh, and the industrial catalyst okay uh, i have no idea but it has seemed to me very intriguing uh, that the nitrogenous enzyme you know uh, which is what uh, uh, leguminous plants uh, use to fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen uh, is an iron sulfur uh, protein you know and guess what the active metal are iron and molybdenum now am i to believe that there is any relationship between the mechanism by which nitrogen binds to uh, uh, the enzyme and what happens in an actual catalyst hard to imagine that there would be any relationship you know but at the same time it is coincidental okay that uh, what uh, uh, bosch found uh, is that uh, finally what succeeded uh, for them uh, is an iron catalyst and it says molybdenum particularly in mixture was also found to be an excellent catalyst isn't that curious you know that uh, uh, iron and molybdenum uh, which are uh, found in nature also happen to be present uh, in the industrial catalyst okay now let's read what bosch says the accomplishment of the second task was no less significant osmium a very good catalyst was difficult to maintain since when in its active that is finely dispersed form it comes into contact with air never wholly avoidable under industrial conditions it readily volatilizes as osmium tetroxide so that was one reason that osmium you know in a, osmium tetroxide is is a gas it volatilizes you know and it is very clear that they always had a problem of traces of oxygen being present uh, in their reaction mixture they could never completely make it a 100% nitrogen hydrogen you know so that was a problem okay and but in particular that was not been the only reason but in particular because the whole world supply amounted to only a few kilograms hence at best we could have based only a very moderate manufacture on osmium and bsf a giant company they are not interested in moderate manufacture they had plans to make billions of tons okay and then what was the other catalyst uranium uranium was expensive of course yet nevertheless obtainable in some quantity but proved extremely sensitive to oxygen and water and it could not and still cannot be converted by any means into a form that can be used for a mass production process you know so they basically ruled out uh, uranium and osmium not because you know they were just trying to be one up on heber and uh, trying to say hey heber you know you might have done this you know but we have invented a a better catalyst it's not just that there were genuine problems uh, with the catalyst that heber had worked on okay however as a result of very broadly based series of experiments using our rapidly expanded experimental techniques we succeeded in preparing relatively fast acting technically perfect easily manipulable stable and inexpensive catalyst chiefly those with iron as the active substance the look at this went back to square one went back to ramsey and yam you know and said you know let us see if there is any hope in the world of trying to maybe ramsey and yam uh, it's not just a question of iron but what kind of iron uh, may uh, have a profound bearing Uh, on its uh, uh, functioning as a catalyst you know and that's the kind of uh, uh, question that they had why did bsf had that confidence because you know bsf had already developed the contact process which you have learned about you know manufacture of sulfuric acid 
uh, with vanadium pentoxide as a catalyst. But did we, uh, BASF only use vanadium pentoxide? No. Vanadium pentoxide by itself is a good catalyst, but not the commercial catalyst. They were able to introduce, you know, all kinds of additives, you know, which help to promote the functioning of vanadium pentoxide as a catalyst. And that is the ca commercial catalyst. So they must have said, hey, why don't we try the same game, you know, with iron as we did with vanadium pentoxide and let's see if we can improve its catalytic activity. No. And one of those improvements uh, was molybdenum. And, you know, I don't know, uh, but it could well be uh, that they drew inspiration uh, from nature. Okay. Now, the other thing was uh, something that we learned from his uh, uh, Hebel, uh, Bosch's Nobel lecture. We were able to conduct the many separate examinations necessary for the discovery of the catalyst and for development to maximum efficiency, which over the years grew to the number of 20,000. Can you imagine doing 20,000 experiments? I mean, who would have the patience to do that? Today, you know, you may be able to do uh, with things like uh, high throughput screening. You know, there are uh, things where uh, uh, automatically, you know, I can put it in machines uh, and, and the machines can do uh, uh, maybe on their own, unattended, uh, maybe 100 to 100 experiments in a day, you know, in high throughput screening. Those didn't exist at that time. And, uh, you know, 20,000 experiments. So I hope you can imagine, okay, the number of people who must have been working on this problem, okay, and their enormous patience. And what kind of data uh, logging, you know, data management, uh, which they had, you know, uh, to be interpret, you know, results from all these uh, 20,000 experiments, uh, which probably helped them uh, to come up with the best catalyst. You know, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, uh, uh, we lose patience even doing, if, if your professor says, go and do this experiment once more, you know, or go and do it, uh, and I want you to uh, uh, vary uh, pressure and temperature, uh, you know, uh, uh, do it in four different pressures and four different temperatures, uh, you can do a factorial design of experiments and you can uh, figure out, you know, maybe you can come to about 20, 30 experiments, okay, and do it, but 20,000. Let us uh, 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 see, uh, you know, uh, another very, very remarkable thing uh, that uh, uh, we've learned, okay. Uh, they did 20,000 experiments, okay, uh, but uh, their work, you know, uh, was uh, uh, largely um, empirical. Okay? It was really about trial and error, you know, and, and they, they, they succeeded, okay. And uh, the person who was heading uh, their catalyst team uh, was this gentleman, Mitash. You know? uh, he was the one uh, who had this task of identifying the the catalyst, okay, and uh, we learn uh, of what exactly happened. How did uh, BASF get successful, you know, uh, from uh, the Nobel lecture of Ertl, uh, another German, uh, this Nobel lecture was developed in 2007, okay, and Ertl was the one who unraveled the mechanism of ammonia synthesis. How exactly does the catalyst work? Okay. That's what uh, Ertl's interest was. When was the uh, Bosch, uh, uh, you know, this commercialization taking place? Maybe around 1920, you know, 1930 got the Nobel Prize. You know, it must have been operating these plants uh, for at least 10 to 12 years. You know? And so 1920, uh, when did Ertl get the Nobel Prize? 2007. When did Ertl do... Uh, his uh, seminal work you know, in the late 60s and 70s. You know, I'm talking about 50 years later you know, that uh, 
uh, Ertl was able to unravel, you know, the mechanism by which uh, uh, the catalyst works. You know? And the reason why I'm telling you this, okay, is that, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, it would be very naive to assume that I have to wait till I have understood everything there is to know, you know, about the mechanism of a reaction, you know, to, to commercialize the technology. Clearly, that is not the case. And especially in catalysis, that's certainly not the case. I mean, you know enough about it that uh, uh, that I can practice it. I, is the mechanism so important? Not at all. But what is important, of course, is I must understand safety issues because I can't afford to let uh, uh, the thing catch fire. I certainly would like to uh, uh, operate it uh, uh, at the most desirable temperature and pressure, you know, which is uh, uh, from a manufacturing perspective uh, appealing. Okay? Those kinds of things, of course, I'll do. But uh, whether it, you know, uh, uh, whether the nitrogen first breaks up, you know, and at absorbs on uh, uh, on the metal as uh, as nitrogen atoms, or whether it uh, absorbs as a molecule and then uh, splits into two, or whether uh, you know the hydrogen start uh, adding into uh, uh, the N two molecule, which is N triple bond, okay, and slowly weakens the nitrogen nitrogen bond and it falls apart. You know, those are uh, uh, wonderful things to of course uh, uh, understand but not so critical from a manufacturing point of view. Okay? So uh, let's try and understand uh, what Ertl says uh, in his uh, Nobel lecture. However, large scale technical production would not have been possible without the availability of a large of large quantities of a cheap catalyst. The whole world supply of the precious metal osmium was only 80 kg in those days, you know. That's what uh, Bosch has referred to as a few kg. Okay? Uh, this task could be solved successfully by A. Mitash, who in thousands of tests found that a material derived from a Swedish iron ore exhibited satisfactory activity. In other words, you know, uh, probably something that uh, Ramsey and Young never thought of, you know, BASA probably told Mitash or he himself told himself uh, that, hey, let me go and try and after all, how was the iron catalyst made? It was made from an ore. You know? So he would have said, go and find all the ores in the world you know, and uh, make the catalyst out of it and see if uh, all of them give you the same activity or different activity. And what Mitash found uh, is that the Swedish iron ore uh, gave an exceptional activity. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, later on, uh, with much, much deeper uh, study, uh, because they are the ones who introduce these concepts of promoters uh, and activators of catalysts, you know, uh, what they found uh, is that this iron ore uh, contains probably uh, some of the uh, the so-called promoters, you know, uh, which enhance the activity of the uh, catalyst. You know, I, uh, as I told you, I always like uh, to uh, uh, put myself in the shoes of others and ask, did I ever do anything which even remotely okay, uh, uh, would have, uh, uh, which has some relationship to, uh, to this, okay? And it's always, you know, uh, you, you can always do this, always try to connect because it gets much more pleasurable. And I remember, you know, uh, maybe about uh, four or five years back, uh, I was a consultant to a company called Atul Industries. Uh, they're very big uh, in making uh, uh, things like phenol and epoxy and many other uh, uh, compounds. And one of the transformations uh, which were, they were trying to do uh, was to convert uh, uh, an, uh, a toluene-like uh, derivative, you know, uh, so a benzene ring with a methyl group uh, into an aldehyde uh, for further transformation into uh, some products that they uh, required, you know. And uh, that uh, 
methyl to aldehyde conversion is very well known in organic chemistry uh, that you can do it with manganese dioxide it's a highly selective uh, catalyst you know and uh, uh, the manganese dioxide in our country uh, almost all of it comes from uh, uh, from uh, uh, from nagpur okay and uh, now they were uh, interested because uh, their requirement of manganese dioxide was stoichiometric is not a catalyst it is actually a stoichiometric reagent and then after its use uh, they convert the uh, the residual catalyst into manganese uh, sulfate and then it goes into a, a poultry feedstock you know uh, it it's a nutrient for uh, for poultry okay so they sell it into uh, those kinds of uh, outlets you know and when i was hearing all this you know i said uh, uh, you know isn't it possible to convert uh, this uh, uh, respent catalyst uh, back into a uh, Uh, manganese dioxide okay and uh, and they said yeah it would be a great idea you know and then uh, uh, you know uh, some people uh, uh, developed the process for making uh, uh, manganese dioxide uh, but then uh, they broke the bad news to me and they said uh, sir although your idea was good uh, you know it doesn't work you know? this manganese dioxide doesn't work and i said is manganese dioxide right i mean you analyze and uh, you know you realize at that time uh, that many of these solid state catalysts okay uh, they have uh, uh, as you know uh, any solid will have uh, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, crystallographic planes you know uh, like for sodium chloride you know uh, that there are the 111 and the 100 and uh, uh, you know things like that uh, these are the crystallographic planes and what matter is what is the crystallographic plane uh, which is present on the surface of the catalyst because the action is on the surface okay and uh, you know so uh, uh, it was something uh, that uh, uh, triggered some thought in my uh, mind you know as i was uh, reading this that what's so unique about uh, the swedish i know uh, maybe something like that okay yeah. and then it says remarkably despite the enormous technical significance of the heber bosch reaction and despite of numerous laboratory studies uh, its actual mechanism remained unclear over many years okay so you know bsa was producing huge amounts but not knowing fully the mechanism and then it says ph emit and who's emit you know uh, all of you who know about bt surface area okay that emit that bt the e stands for emit in bt okay and uh, uh, one of the giants in uh, uh, catalysis and he was being honored in 1974 you know and around that time uh, what uh, uh, emit said is that the experimental work of the past 50 years leads to the conclusion that the rate limiting step in ammonia synthesis over iron catalyst is the chemisorption of nitrogen the question as to whether the nitrogen species involved is molecular or atomic is still not conclusively resolved okay? and uh, but you know it was clear you know that uh, chemisorption is going to be important but in what way you know this chemisorption occurs uh, was always uh, uh, something of a bit of a uh, unknown okay yeah. so you know uh, you, uh, what uh, ertl had uh, was again like what we saw uh, you know uh, uh, other people having a special equipment like heber or uh, norman sutin you know ertl had a very very advanced surface spectroscopy unit okay? and with which uh, he he could do uh measurements on the surface okay which nobody else could do surface spectroscopy was well established you know things like sem tem etc all of those things were there you know but with what kind of resolution uh, can i study things you know uh, that was the issue and whether i can study it under a practical set of conditions or an impractical set of conditions that was another issue you know 
but Ertl had developed these tools. Okay? And uh, BSF, you know, uh, were happy to share their uh, catalyst with Ertl, uh, and they also told him the uh, conditions which they uh, normally use, you know, uh, in the reaction, which is uh, about 400 degrees centigrade and 300 bar pressure, you know. And uh, what uh, Ertl did uh, <clears throat> was they took this catalyst, presumably the uh, catalyst derived from iron ore, okay. And, uh, you know, so what Turtle did was first he estimated the bulk composition of the catalyst and he found these things, you know. It turns out uh, that some of these things are promoters, okay. Uh, now, then he said, of course, uh, the reaction is taking place at the surface and I'm not really using, uh, because the iron ore, uh, these are things like magnetite, you know, Fe3O4, you know, those kinds of oxides. Uh, but the catalyst is iron in an Fe state. You know? And so it has to be reduced. Okay? And, uh, uh, you know, so what uh, he did was he, uh, they, he reduced the uh, catalyst. He also saw the, what is the composition before uh, reducing and uh, what is the composition after reducing, you know. And, uh, uh, he could see that uh, on average, you know, uh, the uh, the composition, of course, compared to the bulk, you know, uh, the uh, the iron uh, amount on the uh, surface was much lower. Okay, these were higher, okay? and uh, so he had some idea that uh, the surface concentration is quite different from the bulk. Then what he did, you know, is that his machine. Uh, and I've seen this instrument before because uh, there was another very famous uh, uh, surface scientist called uh, David Briggs, you know, who was working in the company where I was uh, working in England. And Briggs had shown me his equipment where, uh, you, you know, they could have, they could actually move the spot, you know, where they're trying to do an analysis by something like what? Uh, five microns. Okay, and so they could analyze, you know, five micron by five micron uh, area, you know, a spot, and they could analyze another spot. And so, you know, they can actually go around, okay, and pinpoint at specific areas. And uh, uh, Ertl had also developed the technology uh, by which he could correlate, you know, his analysis with, uh, uh, with the formation of ammonia. Uh, don't worry about uh, how exactly he did it, okay? And what he found is that he he, he hit upon some spots, okay, where uh, the surface composition was very different uh, from the average surface concentration, you know, which is over here. And so uh, it had a much higher uh, concentration of uh, iron, you know, it had an extremely high composition of potassium, you know, which later on they identified uh, potassium and aluminium as a very good support for uh, for the catalyst, you know, and to some extent calcium, you know. And so, uh, you know, that's what they found. And so after that, you know, obviously what uh, uh, they must have done uh, is try to see uh, how they can uh, uh, carry out uh, their reduction processes uh, so that, you know, they are able to replicate uh, this active spot throughout the catalyst. Because then there would be a huge improvement in the performance of the catalyst.